Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, and thank you to Molly Brumman for organizing this event. Um, and thanks also to Richard Leiter and Richard Moberly for developing this speaker series, uh, and to Dean Susan Poser for supporting it. I think this is a great opportunity for students and faculty to talk about legal scholarship, and just as importantly, for students and faculty to get together over a beer. So thank you all for coming and helping support this new Nebraska tradition uh, that I hope continues for many years. Uh, and thanks also to my research assistants, Lori Hedger and Eric Wrights, for their great help uh, on this project and on other projects. So in law school, we often focus on what judges say on the reasons they give justifying their decisions. And this is, of course, important in understanding the development of the common law and constitutional doctrine. Today, however, I'm going to focus on what judges, in particular Supreme Court justices, don't say when they decide constitutional cases. My argument is that there is a set of under-theorized, under-explained stealth determinations that play a significant role in many constitutional decisions, but operate mostly underneath the radar screen, escaping careful attention because they are, in fact, stealthy. We should care about these stealth determinations in part because they recur in constitutional cases, so they can provide some insight into issues the court regularly confronts. The pragmatic litigator, in other words, will want to know what unarticulated factors help drive the court's decision making. But we should also care about these stealth determinations because they raise important questions about judicial transparency and the role judicial explanations have in our constitutional democracy. To clarify what I mean by stealth determinations, let me identify some characteristics they share. First, the questions underlying these determinations arise frequently in constitutional cases. Second, despite their common recurrence, the Supreme Court often fails to explain thoroughly its reasoning when it makes such determinations. Third, and consequently, these determinations are usually not reflected in the black letter doctrine, such as the tiers of scrutiny, the substantial effects tests, and so on. Fourth, the court often fails to reconcile adequately the determinations across cases so that its approach in one case often lacks precedential effect in another. Fifth, the court also fails to explain just how central these determinations are to the resolution of some cases. And as a result of all of this, I argue, 
It's difficult for litigants, lower courts, and even future justices to know how to handle these kinds of determinations in a predictable manner. Indeed, it's hard to say the extent to which they enjoy the status of law. I want to emphasize this phenomenon of stealth determinations through the lens of one particular case, Lawrence v. Texas, which was decided a little under a decade ago, and the light it shines or fails to shine on a related issue possible to reach the Supreme Court soon, same-sex marriage. Lawrence, as many of you know, held unconstitutional Texas's statute criminalizing same-sex sodomy. One would be forgiven for thinking that Lawrence, probably the court's most prominent gay rights case, should hold clues about how the court will approach same-sex marriage or gay rights issues more generally. On closer view, however, Lawrence offers little guidance to litigants, lower court judges, or the Supreme Court itself, and not just because it expressly declined to address the marriage question. I will briefly explain how stealth determinations help render Lawrence's legal reasoning opaque, and then turn to larger explanations for and implications of those determinations. So Lawrence, I argue, turned on a series of under-theorized stealth determinations. It framed the question at a broad level of generality. It relied on hybrid reasoning using equal protection rationales to support uh, liberty holding. It declined to identify a level of scrutiny. It invoked changing public opinion. And it overruled an earlier constitutional decision, Bowers v. Hardwick. Each of these moves helped the court justify its outcome. But significantly, the court inadequately theorized each determination, leaving considerable doubt about how it would approach similar inquiries in future cases. A potential same-sex marriage case highlights the problem. Such a case may well turn on how the court resolves the kinds of determinations it made in Lawrence. For example, as in Lawrence, the court deciding a same-sex marriage case will need to decide what level of generality to frame the question at. At a high level of generality, the issue may be framed as whether one has the right to marry the person of one's choosing. At a narrower level, the right may be understood to extend only to one unmarried man and un one unmarried woman. Of course, the levels of generality questions in a marriage case are not identical to Lawrence, whereas Lawrence required the court to determine the level of generality at which to articulate an, un an asserted unenumerated liberty. A same-sex marriage case poses the definitional question. How broadly or narrowly should we define the concept of marriage? Nevertheless, the inquiries are similar enough that one would think that litigants in a marriage case could look to see how Lawrence justified framing its question at a broad level. However, because Lawrence offered such sparse justification for why that framing was appropriate, there's little to guide the court in selecting a level of generality in other cases. Relatedly, a same-sex marriage case might turn on the constitutional rights at stake. Same-sex couples claiming the right to marry can make arguments rooted in liberty, equality, or both, such as arguments based on the fundamental rights component of the Equal Protection Clause. Lawyers will likely press several plausible options, but the court nevertheless will enjoy substantial leeway to address the questions it chooses. Lawrence was ostensibly a liberty case, but the court relied heavily on equal protection reasoning to bolster its liberty holding. Indeed, many commentators have noted that the court was able to reach an outcome that might not have been possible had it considered liberty and equality concerns independently. Once again, though, the court did not explain when such constitutional borrowing is appropriate, so it's hard to know when it might blur doctrinal categories again in future cases. Lawrence also justified its holding by pointing to change public norms. Cultural values necessarily play some role in constitutional decision making. And Lawrence's invocation of societal attitudes towards homosexuality was that case's most explicit acknowledgement of the court's relationship with an extrajudicial constitutional culture. In particular, Lawrence noted that by 2003, only four states had laws targeting same-sex sodomy. 
But while the court was probably correct that the challenge statute was out of step with many Americans' values, it nevertheless left unclear both its methodology for drawing such conclusions and the precise legal relevance of such cultural transformation. Such questions could be very important in a same-sex marriage case. Recent polls show that same-sex marriage enjoys a majority of support among Americans today, but it's only by a very slim margin. Demographics seem to favor same-sex marriage in the long run, but in the meantime, Lawrence provides little guidance on how the courts should measure and weigh contested cultural norms. To be clear, the point here is not to take a stance either way on Lawrence's correctness nor is it to assert that marriage should have directly addressed same-sex marriage, which was not at issue in that case. My point, rather, is that many determinations the court may need to make in a same-sex marriage case are similar to the determinations it made in Lawrence, and yet the court there provided minimal guidance for considering those issues. As a result, the court may very well approach those inquiries in future cases with a blank slate, thus undermining the predictability that is supposed to provide an important foundation of our legal system. There are, of course, explanations for the court's reliance on these stealth determinations, both in Lawrence and more generally. First, by failing to explain fully its reasoning on a number of points, the court avoids tying its hands in future cases. Second, under-theorized agreements can help secure five votes for an opinion when a majority of justices agree on an outcome, but not the underlying reasoning. Third, Lawrence's stealth determinations may be a reflection of the authoring justice, in this case, Justice Kennedy. Fourth, stealth determinations may reflect courts' efforts to reconcile cultural trends with doctrinal obstacles. By 2003, large portions of the American public deemed anti-sodomy laws morally unacceptable, but pre-existing doctrine like Bowers still made Lawrence a challenging case. The court's stealth determinations then helped it weave around the doctrinal obstacles and still craft an opinion that sounded more or less like law. So on this account, stealth determinations reflect the court's effort to reconcile con constitutional law with cultural values. Notwithstanding these explanations, though, we must still consider the stealth determination's consequences for judicial legitimacy. And I think in one sense, these determinations clearly undermine legal predictability and consistency. It's unclear whether the court's approach to doctrinal categorization, to Issue, to levels of generality, to the tiers of scrutiny, to public opinion, and other subdoctrinal determinations carry any precedential weight. Indeed, the court's erratic approach to these determinations suggests that constitutional law is largely ad hoc, shaped on a case-by-case -case basis by judges who want a particular result. Relatedly, stealth determinations also fail to provide a candid account of judicial decision making. The court in Lawrence did not adequately explain how it decided upon the level of generality or how equality and liberty arguments work together. This too appears to undermine judicial legitimacy insofar as the judicial opinion did not adequately explain the reasoning behind the decision. Moreover, stealth determinations often conceal deeper constitutional tensions that are worthy of more careful exploration. Questions about the level of generality recur in cases about individual rights. Framing an issue broadly will typically make it easier for a court to protect the right, so, the under, so underlying the determination are broader issues about whether courts should err in favor of individual liberties or democratic mandates when the two collide. Similarly, decisions about whether and how to consider public opinion implicate broader issues of how majoritarian our courts should be, and questions about whether to blur doctrinal categories into hybrid rights raise issues about how formalistically we want judges to read the Constitution. Strikingly, discussions of these issues is conspicuously absent from the court's discussions in Lawrence and many other cases. 
It's true these are hard questions, but I would submit they get to the heart of constitutional meaning as much as the so-called black letter doctrine does. By failing to grapple with these issues in a thoughtful, honest, candid way, judges not only create legal uncertainty for future important cases like same-sex marriage, but also neglect developing a coherent, rigorous constitutional vision. That all being said, it's also important to recognize what courts might gain from stealth determinations. The illusion that there are impartial principles settling disputes is part of what attracts people to judicial, to judicial dispute management. Courts are simultaneously arenas of principle and arenas of bias. And most people seem to implicitly recognize this and perhaps even embrace that paradox. To this extent, stealth determinations may be a way in which courts try to preserve their hegemony over constitutional meaning. If judges, instead of rendering these stealth determinations, more candidly acknowledge that they allow their own value judgments to serve as tiebreakers in close cases, they may implicitly relinquish some of the authority they have accumulated in our constitutional system and may undermine some of the stability of that system. Stealth determinations also may be a way for the court to steer around doctrinal obstacles and issue decisions reflecting change cultural norms, thereby engaging with a popular constitutional discourse that shapes not only the public's views about constitutional meaning, but also attitudes about the court itself. So at the end of the day, I would submit that stealth determinations implications are complicated and somewhat contradictory, but in all events, I think they deserve far more attention than the court has given them. Thank you and enjoy your beer.